I guess if you get to a certain point in your career as an actor, once you've done all the other things, you just have to do... Do you just have to do a Holocaust movie? Is that what happens? I don't want to do this! Hi friends, welcome back to my channel and my ongoing quest to review every single movie that Robin Williams ever made. This week, as I said at the end of the Patch Adams review, we are looking at the Robin Williams Holocaust film. If you didn't know there was one, there totally is. 1999's Jacob the Liar is directed by Peter Kasovitz, who I guess to their credit is a Hungarian director who was actually rescued from World War II. Jacob the Liar stars Robin Williams as Jacob Heim, a Polish Jewish shopkeeper who attempts to raise the morale inside of his ghetto. He hears some news on the radio when he's not supposed to have and so he tells people that and then rumor gets around that he himself has a radio and in order to keep up the good spirits and make people think that the war is coming to an end he just lies. And god you gotta love a liar don't you? Like that's one of the like quality traits in a person. Like you, everybody loves a liar. This movie also stars Alan Arkin, Liev Schreiber, Bob Balaban who is, traditionally is like only in comic movies. Michael Jeter, again, Anna Taylor Gordon, who played Anne Frank in something else, and fucking Hector Salamanca from Breaking Bad is in this as well. Blah, blah. This movie did not make me feel good. It's not good, but it's not bad in a, like, it's not bad in a fun way. It's just not a fun movie to watch. It's not enjoyable. So let's just get to the history before we get into that. This is the third and final film produced by Blue Wolf Productions. Most of the crew was handpicked by Marcia Garces Williams. Several of these people worked on Schindler's List as well, so they wanted to build a crew who really just knew what they were doing. That was sort of a payback from Robin's good friend Steven Spielberg, who said that Robin helped list, lift his spirits greatly during the process of Schindler's List when he needed that. The producer of this, uh, Stephen Haft, who also produced Dead Poets Society, said that this film seemed like a way to balance Robin's desires to make something both emotionally nourishing and commercially viable. We will see about that last part. He said that there was a certain looseness to Robin during Dead Poet Society, but during the shooting of Jacob the Liar there was something more going on with Robin that this guy who had known him for a while said he could only call sadness. And if you're shooting a movie that's this fucking bleak, on a set that's this bleak, I just do I can see why. Stephen Haft was quoted as saying, Robin could have done anything, and yet he developed this project. And this project had a lot of resonance for him that was quite sad. This film gets compared to Life is Beautiful, the Roberto Benigni film a lot, because both of those people are, both Robin Williams and Roberto Benigni were getting compared to each other. Roberto Benigni was called the Italian Robin Williams a lot. The one positive review that I noted of Jacob the Liar called Robin Williams the American, Roberto Benigni, which is just like, that is so tiring. <laughs> Jacob the Liar apparently went into production before uh, Life is Beautiful had screened in Italy, so there was really no way for them to know how similar these are going to be and how often they were going to be compared. The praise and the hype and the success of that movie basically like completely squandered any hope that Jacob the Liar had really before it even came out. But this film is basically about, it's based off a novel where this guy, like I sort of already said, he hears some news and he keeps just lying and they're sort of building a resistance, but it's all based on lies. And at the same time, he is harboring this little girl who escaped from a train going to a concentration camp. And it's basically just two hours of white men lying. <laughs> and I can't even begin to tell you how uninteresting that is. The opening scene is just Robin Williams chasing a newspaper through the street. He spends half the movie talking to his dead wife, Hannah, and you get at least a quarter in before it's even explained who that is. He's just running around going, I miss, oh, Hannah, I miss you. Oh, Hannah, I'm all alone at this train yard. And I was like, bro, who the fuck is Hannah? The characters are very inconsistent. There's, uh, or, or very one note. Either they're inconsistent or they're one note. I mean, this Jacob guy, like, fun fact, in a Polish Jewish environment, his name would have pronounced Jacob, not Jacob. So, <laughs> What, do with that what you will. The little girl bounces between these extremes of wanting to play around and be a child and ask questions and then suddenly remembering where she is, I guess. At one point she gets really sick and the doctor comes in and is like, oh, you're fine, it's just a tummy ache. And then he turns to Robin Williams and is like, she's really sick, don't give her anything but boiled water. And he gives her boiled water one time and then suddenly she's well. Uh, never know what she had, never know how she got it, never know how she gets well. There's a ton of side characters. There's Robin Williams' guy, there's like seven or eight interchangeable white men that are part of his resistance, and then there's like all these people's families that kind of show up every half hour or so on the dot. 
there's just a lot to keep up with and a lot of it is not being addressed very well. They do refer to Jacob sarcastically as the illustrious pancake vendor and also the phrase latkes and lies is said which was about uh, all the only interesting things are about pancakes. <laughs> the reasoning for him to continue the lies, so there's this old man who comes up to him in the street because Lee Schreiber's character is a dirty little snitch, and Robin Williams tells him something to get him to stop doing something stupid that he is doing, and then he's the one who spreads the radio thing, like, all across the world. And Jacob tries to be like, hey man, I don't have a radio, I was lying to get you to stop, and he's like, you silly goose, that's exactly what somebody would have that had a radio would say. So ultimately this isn't even Jacob's fault, but he does continue the lies, like, just forever. I don't know, but the point of that is, this old man comes up to him in the street and is like, hey, what's the latest news? And he's like, I don't have any news. I'm a liar. See ya. Then you see that guy's face in slow-mo and you're like, why is that guy's face in slow-mo? Turns out it's because he gives up hope and passes away in the middle of the night. They literally walk up to the corpse and they're like, he just gave, he just pulled the blankets up to his chin and he died. And so that's why the plot of this movie happens. I was just generally so uninterested. This film is listed everywhere as a comedy drama and I don't know where the comedy was supposed to be. I can only assume that it's from the one scene where Robin Williams pretends to do the radio voice for the little girl and he does a Winston Churchill impression for about three minutes. I guess that was supposed to be funny. There's some things that people say here and there that I guess are supposed to be funny. But it, you can't call a film a comedy just because you put Robin Williams in it and have him do an impression and make a hemorrhoids joke later. I just Ugh, it's very clear that this was one of those projects that was handpicked just for him and it just kind of didn't work. And I'm sorry that I can't, I really don't have much more to say about it because the plot is just lies and 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 then they all go to a concentration camp at the end. I just, Holocaust films are pretty standard fare at this point and you just, in order to make a good one, you have to do something different. Like look at like Jojo Rabbit or like The Pianist or I guess even Schindler's List. Like, those films all do something that makes them stand out from all the rest of the, these stories that you've heard a million times before. This is basically just the diary of Anne Frank, but with dudes and a radio. <laughs> like, it just... Jacob the Liar was produced on a $45 million budget and made back just under $5 million in a month-long theatrical run, so nobody else was that interested in it either. As I said earlier, it also the, the release of Life is Beautiful did not help that. The reviews of this were not necessarily overwhelmingly negative, but they were generally pretty displeased. The Rotten Tomatoes consensus is that any real story here is just buried by awkward performances and contrived situations. Roger Ebert wrote of the film that Robin Williams is a talented performer who moves me in the right roles but has a weakness for the wrong ones. The screenplay and direction are lugubrious as the characters march in their overwritten and often overacted roles towards a foregone conclusion. Because this has one of the endings where like the protagonist dies before the true ending. So it's like, he doesn't know what happened, so then you kind of have to guess. Do they die in the concentration camp or do they get saved? And it's, well, you know, it seems like it's pretty obvious, but they shoot, <laughs> they put a happy ending in there. Kenneth Turan, the critic who did not like any of Robin's serious roles, who I've mentioned before, didn't like Good Will Hunting, hated What Dreams May Come, wrote this of Jacob the Liar. Robin Williams, enough already. Enough with the compassionate roles, the humanitarian roles, the caring and concerned roles. Remember being funny? Could you try that again? I, I don't know. I guess we'll see. Obviously, so the critical response and the box office response are very poor. Robin also received a dual Razzie nomination for his performance here and in next week's film by Centennial Man, but he lost to Adam Sandler in Big Daddy. Um... <laughs> Said. This is not a film that I'd necessarily recommend if it's something that you've ever seen and liked. I don't think that this is a film that most people have seen. I saw it for sale in a box set with Moscow on the Hudson, which is like, wow, his two accent films. That's great. It's just generally very boring. It's not special. It doesn't do anything really to distinguish itself from any of the other films like this that are out there. It's not a special Robin performance at all. It's not anything I'm going to remember that I watched or watch ever again. If you do decide that you want to watch it, you can spend your money <laughs> and rent it on YouTube, Vudu, Amazon Prime, any of those usual places. Next week, I am looking at one of the most notoriously bad Robin Williams films, and I have a guest coming in who says he thinks he remembers this film being good. So this should be an interesting, um, interesting take on Bicentennial Man. I think it may be the most money he ever made 
for just just base salary alone for a movie. But until then, enjoy your uh, hot serving of latkes and lies this week, and I will see y'all next time.